Hello and welcome back to the Sea Scent Journey with me, Ryan. In this section, we're going to continue with NAT, the network address translation. And within that, we're going to look at PAT, the port address translation, which is a technology that allows us to use a single public IP address and multiple private IP addresses. And the way it does that is it uses ports to keep the sessions unique. So this would be part three of NAT. For those who don't know, you can contact me here on YouTube, on LinkedIn, and Twitter. So here we have the network diagram, and it was the same one we're using in static NAT, but now we're going to set up PAT, which is the port address translation, arguably the most common type of NAT that you will see, especially inside a home environment. Now, you can see I've got the same network with the IP addresses. So again, we've got the public side over here, which is a slash 30 between our router on site, which is dot one, and the ISP, which is dot two. And this router has a default gateway pointing towards the next hop of 172.16.02. And then we have the private IP range, which is the 192.168 network, to which we have a switch. And we have a couple of PCs, PC1, 0, and then smartphone 0 and smartphone 1 connecting to an access point. So all of this here will be, of course, layer 2. And then this would be the broadcast domain, which separates the layer 3 networks. And we're going to perform PAT, the port address translation. And what we're going to see is each of these devices inside the private network will obtain an IP address. Um, and we'll actually do DHCP, so we'll do dot one, maybe dot two, whatever IPs it gets, dot four, doesn't really matter because what we're going to do is configure the PAT to match on this entire slash 24. And then when it sees any IP address request come in on that interface here, it will PAT it by changing the source IP to the IP address of the public interface in order to be sent out to public services. And of course, behind the ISP, we might have things like Google, we might have things like Netflix, and long as they know how to reach the front door of our public IP address, the publicly unique IP address, then the PAT, the port address translation, will know which device has put in which request. And therefore, we will make sure that PC1, who's going to Google, doesn't get the response for PC0, who went to Netflix. So let's go ahead and get it configured. The only thing that I've done is set the interfaces up. So the switch has no configuration. It's just a dumb layer 2 switch. No VLANs or anything else configured there. These PCs have literally got no configuration on their NIC card. It's set up as DHCP, so obtain automatically. Same is true with the smartphones and access points. So let's go ahead, configure it, and we'll see what happens. So first things first, because I've done the interfaces, let's just go ahead and double check that. So we're going, going to go across to the CLI of the route in the middle, where the NAT is going to be performed, and we'll check the interfaces. We can see the interfaces are in the up up state and the gig 00 falls into the private network and the gig 01 falls into the public network. The first thing we need to do is configure the DHCP and make sure all of our devices get an IP address. So let's go ahead and do that, similar to what we've done in a previous video. So it would be a good refresh. So we go into the config T, we go into IP DHCP and we give the pool a name. And then within the pool, we need to specify some option. So first off, we need to give it a network. And it's asking for a net mask. And it's asking for the default router. So this is everyone inside the 192.168 network. If you want to get something off your local subnet, who should you redirect your traffic towards? And in this case, it's going to be ourselves, which is the NAT router, which is dot 10. And in a normal environment, you'd give it some sort of DNS, and of course, any other additional options you may require. So things like IP phones, 
may require additional options to help download its configuration from a TFTP server. But in this case, let's keep things simple. Let's just give it a pool, a gateway, and DNS. So once we've configured that, if we look at the show IP DHCP bindings, we can already see a couple of devices have obtained an IP address. Now you can see four devices have obtained an IP address, just as what we would expect. So let's make a, a bold assumption that our four end host, in this case, the smartphones and the PCs have obtained the IPs as expected. So next up, we're gonna do the NAT. And again, just like we did in the previous video, we need to do that from scratch by first of all, setting up the IP NAT statements on the interfaces. So in the private side of the NAT, we're gonna put in IP NAT inside. And on the public IP NAT outside. Now, unlike the static NAT, which was a single translation, here we have a range of IP addresses that we need to match against. And the way we match against that is using something that we've not talked about yet called an ACL, an access control list. Now an ACL contains ACEs, which is a access control entry. And ultimately it's a bunch of entries, which are IP addresses that will match in a list. Now at the CSEN and CCNA, you get shown ACLs are for access control. So can I access a router? Well, if your IP address is on an ACL, then you're permitted. If your IP address is not on an ACL, then you're denied. But what you would find as you continue throughout your studies is ACLs can be used for other things. So root filtering, summarization, and in this case, it's used to match the source IP address or the source subnet in order to justify or able to identify, I should say, sorry, whether it should or should not be NATed. And in this case, the type of NAT again is PAT. PAT is sometimes referred to as overloading or overload because we're essentially putting multiple IPs on top of a single public IP address. So let's go ahead and create that AC, ACL. And we do that from the global terminal and it needs to be a standard ACL. So I'm not gonna go into too much details of what standard extended is, as we will be talking about ACLs in upcoming videos. For now, let's just identify it as a list of IPs that's gonna be used for the NAT statement. So we're gonna say IP access list, I want it to be a standard access list, and that access list is gonna be number one. It's now going to ask us who should be in this access list. Now, by default, there's always a deny at the bottom of an access list. So in turn, everything is denied by default. Now, when it's denied, as far as NAT is concerned, it doesn't mean deny as in you're not allowed, but rather there's no match. So in this case, because we want a match to occur, we need to permit something. And the network that we need to permit is the 192 network. So we put in the actual network address and then it's asking us for something called wildcard bits. Now wildcard bits again is something we'll get into in a bit more detail when we move on to access control list but wildcard bit is ultimately the opposite of a subnet mask. So if you think of a subnet mask for this it's actually 255.255.255.0, which is a slash 24. Well, we need to actually revert all the ones and zeros in that in order for an ACL to work. So the zeros become one and the ones become zero. And that means at a binary level. So we know that zero in binary becomes 255, which means that 255 becomes zero. And then you can see the access list entry has been created. So here, again, we're saying permit 192.168.0. 
And then we have that wild card, which is the opposite of a subnet mask, where we have the zeros where the 255s were and the 255 where the zero was. Again, this wildcard concept is very much part of ACLs as a topic, so we will go into it in more detail, but for now, we just need to understand how it would work in order to achieve a NAT configuration. So we now do show IP access list. You can see the access list of one has the permit statement with sequence of 10. So this sequence was automatically given to it. It's permitting just this and sequence 20, which you can see here, will be the deny all, which means that only that one network will be matched. Therefore, if I had another network on a different interface on the router, let's say it was a 172.16.00.24 network, since this is not in the ACL, when the ACL is applied to the NAT statement, nothing will happen to this network. Therefore, just like we've seen in the previous video, it would be routed rather than natted. So the ACLs need to match the internal private IP range that we're trying to nat, or in this case, pat to the public IP range. So now we need to do our nat statement. So just like before, it's a global configuration and we do the IP nat and we're gonna use question mark to help us and it's a inside translation. And the translation source, instead of static, is actually a list. And the list is an access list, and we're gonna NAT to an interface, which is gig, and then the interface would be gig01. And I say that because I need to double check, which it is. But what we also need to do is at the end of the configuration, we need to give it a keyword. And that keyword is the overload. Because the overload allows multiple IPs internally to use the same external IP address. In this case, it's the IP address associated with this interface. And that's why the PAT, so PAT is port address translation, which is a name for the type of NAT that we're using here. And you can see the term overload or overloading originates from the CLI context. So we now look at the show running configuration. We can see that I've created the DHCP pool. We scroll down a little bit further. We can see the outside and the inside statements applied against the relevant interfaces. We can see a default gateway has been statically applied for the next hop of our ISP. And we can see we have a IP NAT statement that says if you're doing IP NAT and the inside source is an access list of one, which is the network, NAT towards the outside IP address on interface gig01 and overload. So what we should see now is when we do some communication from one of the PCs to the ISP, it will hit this NAT statement because it matches in this access control list. And in turn, we would perform overloading or PAT. So if I do show IP NAT translations, you can see at the moment there are no translations because there's no traffic. But if we go on to one of the PCs, check it's got an IP address, rightly so it has, with a default gateway. And let's try to ping Google. And you see I get some sort of reply. So let's go back to the router and look at the translations. And you can see that a translation was done. Now, if I go back to another device, same again, and maybe to a smartphone. Don't know if you can ping from here. Oh, looks like you can. And then again, back to the router. Now you can start to see we have a bunch of NAT translations. Now the translations are all using the same inside global address. Remember, the inside global is the public IP on our side. And the inside local is the private IP. Outside local and outside global is the other side. So the destination that we're reaching, 
because they too can perform NAT. But all of this here and the concept of this is outside the CSENT. So let's not focus too much on that. Let's just focus on what's happening over here. We can see that the show IP NAT translations shows our public address and our private address. And you can see that there are multiple 192.168.04.01.03. So multiple requests from the same host. And you can see these are the port numbers that are being carried through the NAT translation from the device. But you can see here the port number is actually changed by the router itself because the router doesn't want to run into any conflicts. And the idea behind it is when the traffic comes back from the 8.8.8.8 .8 and it has this particular number associated with it, it's able to determine which internal host requested that traffic. So the idea is it's able to use multiple sessions to the same public IP address using ports to keep the sessions unique and that's why we call it PAT, Port Address Translation, because it's the port that's able to help us translate the IP address when we overload it to a single public IP. So that's all we've got time for in this lesson, just to touch base on what we've gone over. We looked at the PAT configuration. We again applied the IP NAT inside to the interface connecting to the private network and IP NAT outside connecting to the public network. So this is always required because it ensures that when traffic hits the interface, it falls to the NAT process. We then configured things like ACLs, the access control list, and we said a permit statement means match and a deny statement means don't match. By default, we have the implicit deny, which means don't match anything. And we had to have that manual permit statement, sequence 10, to permit the inside IP range or the private IP range. And we had to use that wildcard, which is the opposite of a subject mask, to achieve that. Again, the ACLs will go into a bit more detail in later videos. We then had to globally ab apply the configuration using the IP NAT inside command. Um, so from the global configuration, we done IP NAT inside. And then the source would actually come from a list, which was the ACL that we created. We then overloaded it to an external interface. And it's important that we keep that keyword of overload on the end of the global statement. Otherwise, it won't use the um, public IP multiple times. We then went on to our host and generated a bunch of traffic to public services and we were able to see that the show IP NAT translation showed that the port number, the source port number, the ephemeral port, was being used as a mechanism to uh, essentially keep each session unique from one another, allowing the end host to request traffic to the same destination, but the router itself able to keep track of which device requested which traffic. And we also seen that if there is an overlap in the ports, the router reassigns the port numbers locally to allow the session to be unique. So that's all we've got time for in this lesson. I hope this has been informative and I'd like to thank you for viewing. And if it has been, please do like and subscribe.